smiling for the camera, but behind the happy faces, Darren and Liam Mackay's bank account told a different story. Spending twice as much as they earned, the couple were in serious debt. By all accounts, Leanne and Darren McKee's relationship was perfect. Leanne's Instagram is a shrine to her family, but behind the Christmas excitement and cheesy grins lay a cold-blooded killer who used their position in the police to attempt a forensic cover-up of the most brutal crime. This is Red Rum, stories about the true victims of crime. This video is made from various source documents listed in the show notes. I use news archives, documentary footage and court documents and so the videos are accurate to the source materials I can find. Leanne and Darren were a tight-knit family unit with three of their own children and a marriage that started 13 years ago. The couple were similar in their chosen fields of work with Leanne working as a detective constable and Darren working as an inspector, both for the Greater Manchester Police. Darren's colleagues spoke of him as a well-respected and well-regarded member of their team. He'd been working for the police service for 21 years. He was really looked up to in the local community and from an outsider's perspective, he really did seem to have it all. He had an almost impeccable career. Leanne's co-workers thought of her as incredibly kind-hearted and generous and her neighbours commented on how much they trusted her. Back in 2014, Leanne and Darren made the decision to move from Sale in Greater Manchester to Hale, not too far away, but it was a much more desirable area and the only house they could afford needed quite a lot of work doing. They decided to go all out with the renovation and got a lot of work done and that meant they had a lot of debt. They actually couldn't even afford to pay for all of the work that they'd had done, even with the amount of loans that they'd taken out. So both Leanne and Darren's parents helped them out separately. But although this wasn't something that was sustainable, the couple continued racking up even more debts over the next couple of years, spending time together in luxury hotels and spas. In July of 2014, they spent a weekend at Dormy House, a hotel in the Cotswolds that now, in 2023, averages a price of just under £400 a night. And so, by 2017, the couple found themselves in a very worrying financial position. But they decided to have their house valued. They'd obviously done a lot of work on it, and it was in a really good area. And so they decided to get the house valued, and it had gone up a lot. But instead of selling, paying off some debts, and then using the rest of the money to move, they decided to sell and then upsize. And in September of 2017, they found their dream house in Wilmslow, Cheshire. They bought it for just under £450,000. The first night they spent there, Leanne uploaded a photo to her Instagram saying, we're in our new home, fizz and dominoes on the menu tonight. On Leanne's Instagram, she's uploaded photo after photo of her family. She's very clearly proud of them and she wants to show them to her family and friends. There are numerous photos of Darren and she playfully nicknamed him Dazzle on more than one occasion. The couple continued to live a pretty luxurious life, but the money that the couple were earning was still well under their monthly outgoings and every single month they were overspending by about £1,500 and they simply couldn't afford it. It's difficult to know the extent to what Leanne did know and what she was unaware of. The couple took their three children on holiday to Portugal and it cost over £6,000. But it is reported that by this point, Leanne had no real idea about how much money trouble they were in overall. Just before they bought their new house, Leanne found evidence that Darren had tried to take out a loan for around £10,000, but Darren protested his innocence, swearing that he never did that. He told Leanne that the only thing he could think of was that the attempt to gain a £10,000 loan was some kind of fraudulent activity, and he said he'd take a look into it. He later told her that it was all taken care of, and as would become a bit of a running theme, Darren would continue telling Leanne that their finances were taken care of and that they were back on track. There was still some debt there, but they were making moves towards fixing that. They wouldn't have to go to their families anymore and they wouldn't need to be bailed out. But that wasn't exactly the truth. 
In fact, every month that went by, Darren was getting them even deeper into debt, and he wasn't letting Leanne in on any of it. But then, on the 28th of September 2017, there was a knock on Leanne and Darren's door. Darren was at work and so Leanne answered it, and it was a delivery that she had to sign for, which in itself was odd because she wasn't expecting anything that day. But when Leanne brought the small package inside and opened it up, she saw that inside was her passport and a false email address was stated for her. She had no idea that her passport had been sent off at all, and alongside it was a payslip of hers. It became clear that Darren had logged onto her account by using her password, and then he downloaded her payslip and forged her signature on it. He then sent it off to apply for a £54,000 loan. It was later discovered that he'd done all of this on police computers during work time. Leanne got her phone out and texted Darren calling him a liar and telling him what she'd just got through the post. After getting that series of texts from Leanne, Darren then left work early. Now, he had already arranged to leave a bit early to go home. They had a survey being carried out at 1.30 p.m. But as soon as he got those messages that morning, he decided to head straight back home, arriving at his house much before the originally planned time of 1.30. Meanwhile, Leanne was supposed to be turning up at 3 p.m. for her eight hour shift, but she never showed. We go back to around midday, and that's when Darren arrived home to Leanne, who was very likely angry. We don't know the exact details of what happened next, because Darren has never fully admitted the truth. But what we do know from the court documents is that Darren strangled Leanne shortly after he arrived home at midday. He'd strangled her so hard that he'd actually fractured two bones in her throat and caused extensive bruising. He placed his hand over her mouth to stop her from screaming and the bruises on her lips showed this. And then, after he made sure that Leanne was definitely dead, he began to plan what he was going to do next. He was on a time limit at this point, because the surveyor that was due to come round at 1.30pm was just 45 minutes away. So, at about 12.45pm, Darren dragged Leanne's body into her red mini, and then CCTV tracks him, driving it off of the drive and down the road. And a few minutes later, Darren travels on foot back to the house. The surveyor had actually arrived early and clocked Darren walking back to the house. He waited for Darren to go inside the house and then went up to the door and knocked on. And then he began the survey. The man would later comment about how calm and normal Darren was acting during the 40 minutes he was inside the house. We know that Darren works in intelligence, so has a really solid understanding of what the investigating team will be looking for. He has extensive experience, not only of investigations and how they work, but also of intelligence and understanding how technology can contribute to surveillance and evidence. He went onto Leanne's phone and deleted all of the calls she'd made to him that morning after she'd found out about the loan application. He also messaged Leanne asking where she was at and if she was okay. One of those messages he sent said, quote, you okay, bit worried now. After that, he then drove to their children's school to pick them up and he waited outside the school gates for them to come out and it's reported that he just talked quite normally to other parents at the school gate and then he picked his children up, they went home and his son then asked where his mum was to which Darren simply replied that she was at work and then he continued the evening activities as normal. And then at around 10.30 p.m., after he had put the children to bed, Darren drove Leanne's red mini, with Leanne still in the boot, all the way over to Paddock Hill Farm, and it's thought that that was, his plan then was to dump Leanne's body in the water. But when he got there, he realised he had a pretty big problem. The water in front of him just wasn't deep enough to adequately dispose of Leanne's body, and importantly, hide her. And so, he had to quickly think about what he was going to do next, what his next plan was going to be. He took Leanne's phone out of the car and he placed it at Paddock Hill Farm or he dropped it unintentionally, it's not quite clear. Although detectives do think that he may have left it there intentionally to try and throw detectives off 
um, of where she might be, but he's never admitted to doing that, so it's very possible that he just dropped it. Darren then drove around for a little while before eventually finding himself at Poynton Lake as a place to dump Leanne's body. So he dragged her body about 140 yards along the path and placed her in the river or in the lake face down in the water. And after that, he ended up driving the Red Mini and he parked about an, a mile away from the lake. And then he decided to make the six mile walk home. And by this time, it is well after midnight. And so he's walking along in the dark. And then in an unbelievable coincidence, at just after 1.30 a.m., the police just happen to be conducting a routine patrol to do with some burglaries in the area that had happened. And they spot Darren. Now, at this point, they don't know who he is. So they stop him to talk to him to see what he's doing. But he says that he's not doing anything wrong and he's not gonna give them his name or details about himself. And because he wasn't breaking any law, they just had to let him go. But then, about 30 minutes later, police see Darren again, and this time, he's not wearing any shoes. Now, the first time the police saw Darren, there wasn't a whole lot that they could do, but once they saw him again, their suspicion increased to the point where they couldn't just let him go. They really needed some more details from him. And Darren's excuse for what he was doing and the fact he wasn't wearing any shoes was that he told them he'd been out drinking and he'd had about half a bottle of wine. And obviously he said he wasn't gonna drink and drive and that's why he was walking this distance home. He also said that his shoes were too tight and so that's why he wasn't wearing them, he just abandoned them somewhere on the way home. And finally, he said that he was out looking for his wife who had been missing for a few hours and hadn't been responding to his text messages. And so on, this, on the police's suggestion, they say to him, why don't you try and call your wife right now and we'll, we'll see if she answers. And so Darren does try and call um, Leanne and he makes that phone call and of course it goes straight to voicemail and he leaves her a voicemail asking where she's at and asking please to call him as soon as possible. And it was at this point that one of the officers questioning him saw that Darren was wearing police issued trousers. And so they told him that and that's when he really had to admit who he was and he gave them his full name. And after that, the officers obviously want to help him. And so they pick Darren up and they drive him back home. But obviously they've just been told his wife is missing, so they return shortly after that at around 4am at this point. And they say to Darren, we'll try and help you locate your wife. Why don't we look at the Find My iPhone app and see if we can find Leanne's iPhone? And they actually managed to track it. It had about 5% battery left, so it was still emitting a signal. And so they managed to track her phone down to Paddock Hill Lake. And the officers quickly removed the phone, but unnervingly, they looked around and there was just no sign of Leanne or where she might be. It was just her phone. So they took the phone back to police headquarters and they managed to start downloading the data that they needed from it in order to build the most accurate picture of her last moments before she disappeared. It wasn't long after that that police arrived at Darren's house to arrest him. He came without fuss. He probably knew he had to. There was no point resisting arrest. But whilst the officers were at Darren's house, they could hear the washing machine running. And later, evidence was retrieved from that washing machine. He'd obviously attempted to clean it. Forensic teams examined the entire house and they brought in even more vital forensic evidence. In the interview room, Darren told police that he had no idea what had happened to Leanne. He said that, the pair of them had argued earlier that day and that she'd driven off from the house in her red mini and he'd been with her and he said that she was angry and that she'd driven a little while down the road and then just dropped him off and let him go back to the house. But of course the officers questioning him didn't believe him and the mobile phone evidence that they were currently downloading would later prove this. The phone evidence tracked Leanne and Darren's phones, both making the same journey away from their house and towards Paddock Hill Farm. And they cross-checked the timings of when this happened with some of the messages that were received from Leanne's phone and found that 
Darren had been messaging Leanne at the exact time when their phones were together, asking where she was and saying that he was worried about her. And that was at the same time, so it just didn't make any sense to officers. And they knew that not only was Darren lying, but they had the evidence to prove it. Darren's story that Leanne had gone off, stormed off, and he'd been walking back to the house to meet the surveyor was totally untrue. He went on to say that he believed that she'd been abducted and likely killed by a stranger. That's where his mind went to first. But this just made no sense with that mobile phone evidence. But Darren's real downfall came when police searched the area nearby where Leanne was eventually found and they came across a bin and inside that bin were a pair of running shoes. Forensics were conducted and they found that there was both Darren's DNA inside and fluids found on the outside of them that matched Leanne and that fluid was blood. And it was later said that this blood had come from not an injury that Leanne had sustained during the attack, but it was a natural process that had happened after she had been strangled. It had come out of her nose and mouth. The police later did find Leanne's body and they found that she had been strangled. This, along with the police officer testimony from the night of Leanne's disappearance, were that they'd first seen him wearing those shoes and then later they'd seen him and he wasn't wearing the shoes and this was damning. Darren was presented with all of this evidence and it's clear at this point that he knows he's done for. And so, although he initially pleaded not guilty to murder, Darren changed his story, now saying that he wanted to plead guilty to manslaughter, finally admitting that it was him who had killed Leanne, but importantly, he stated he never intended to do it. But the judge refused this and instead found Darren guilty of the murder of Leanne and eventually he was sentenced and he was sentenced to life in prison. He was given a minimum term of 19 years and that minimum term was gonna be 15 years, but the judge said that he'd made the decision to increase it because of Darren's position as a police officer and his actions and choices after the event that led him to try and get away with murder. And he really did try to get away with murder. He had no consideration for his children. On the night of Leanne's murder, he left them at home on their own, three young children, for over four hours. And he even made this whole case go to trial, making them wait over six months for justice and never fully admitting to what he's done. It's really clear that Darren's number one priority had nothing to do with his wife or his family. It was always only to do with him. Thank you for watching this episode of Red Rum. I really appreciate you being here. Please do consider clicking the subscribe button if you're not already subscribed and uh, drop a case suggestion if you've got any suggestions in the box down below. You can also find us on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. I'll leave those links down below. And we have a Patreon and YouTube membership for early access videos and podcasts. Other than that, I will see you next week for another episode of Red Rum. Bye.